From feelings of hopefulness to desperation, the end of the Indy Road Course race means safety for some drivers and trouble for others. All weekend long, we knew Michael McDowell had a fantastic car. He topped practice and qualified in the top five. It was just a matter of executing when the race happened, and he did exactly that, locking himself in to the 2023 championship fight. Michael McDowell was your winner of the Verizon 200 at the Indy Road Course. There are four key points to this win. First off being how cool is it that you can say that your two cup series victories came from two iconic tracks being Indianapolis Motor Speedway and Daytona International Speedway. That just That's iconic within itself. The second point about this win is that McDowell won this in dominating fashion. It was not a fluke. He had the best car during the race as well, leading the most laps. And he was able to fend off Chase Elliott, who has the most road course wins of any active driver right now in the field. And with like three or four to go in the race, Elliott was fast approaching. He was closing in on the gap. I don't think he was going to be able to get there in time. If there was one more lap, though, perhaps. But there was not another lap in this race. So lucky for McDowell, he was able to hold off Chase Elliott, who ended up settling for second place when it was all said and done. Third, if we expand the scope of this win to look at the winning manufacturer, which is Ford, Think back to a few weeks ago. Ford only had two wins with Joey Logano and Ryan Blaney. Think back now to Richmond, then Michigan, and now Indy. Like We have three wins back to back to back, making five total this season. Clearly, I think at this point, considering the past three races that we've gone to have been at different types of tracks, I think Ford has finally found something. And maybe Penske hasn't found it, but I think these smaller teams have have maybe maybe not but there's been really good consistency from rfk and we've talked about it all season long but front row motorsports have been incredibly consistent especially that 34 team of mcdowell so another stat there with the ford wins and the fourth and final point to this and I, I just mentioned this we have been talking about front row motorsports and michael mcdowell pretty much all season long a, a big win for them this weekend besides the actual you know win that they got that locked themselves into the playoffs is this was michael mcdowell's first and front row motorsports first stage win in the cup series, which is really exciting for that team and for Michael. Also a great win for the crew chief, for the team, just everyone as a whole at Front Row Motorsports. This is such a positive step in the right direction and winning in dominant fashion. This isn't like the Daytona 500 where it was, hey, we led one lap at the end or not even like one lap. They had the caution with the one lap remaining. Uh, but with McDowell in this case, he flat out dominated a race and that has to feel so good to win. Uh, so great job for that entire team. Uh, definitely a win for the, for the books for sure. Mentioned this earlier, but Chase Elliott in the second position. I think the story for a lot of these drivers during this race was they didn't have enough time to make up track position or they couldn't make up track position at all through speed alone. It really had to do with bunching up the field and they didn't get a lot of those opportunities. They only got one opportunity during the race and that was around lap six when there was a caution. Otherwise, we were caution free and there were no stage cautions either. So it really was, is your car fast enough and is your strategy the best to be able to get you to where you need to be on track and can you execute without mistakes? And Chase Elliott, he was flawless. There were no mistakes, but I think he would have benefited from this field bunching back up. Same story with Daniel Suarez, who finished in the third position. However, they did have a pit road error where the air hose got caught under the tire and that caused an extremely long stop. Otherwise, Suarez was leading the first six laps of the race. It just was not meant to be for Daniel Suarez. And he had a great response to his race as well. He said, you know, we win or we lose as a team. They're ready to go back to racing next week at Watkins Glen and see if they can get it done there. Because at this point, we're going to talk about the points in, in a few minutes. But I mean, you're going to have to win to guarantee yourself a spot. And we have two races left remaining in the regular season. Then we're racing for a championship for the remainder of the NASCAR 2023 season. But for Daniel Suarez, they they lost as a team uh, this weekend. It was pretty unfortunate because he had a really strong car, but he lost so much track position. There was no way he was getting that back. In fourth, we have Tyler Reddick. Fifth, Alex Bowman. This is his first top 10 since Richmond in the spring, which is nuts. In sixth place, Chase Briscoe, seventh, Truex, eighth, Larson, ninth, Bell, and tenth, SVG. I know this is not a win. I know we had some really high expectations for Shane Van Gisbergen going into this race. However, this was a top 10 finish, and it's very rare that in the first two starts of somebody's NASCAR Cup Series career that they get back-to-back -to -back top 10s. 
And if we want to put more history behind this with a Srigley stat, Shane is the first driver since 1978 to get back-to-back top 10s in his first two Cup Series starts. The last driver to do that in 1978, you might ask, one of my favorites, Terry Labonte. So a cool stat, and again, just to show you how rare that is and how impressive that is for a driver who didn't go through the NASCAR ranks and is just making his second start. Uh, Pretty wild. Also this past week, I don't know if you heard the rumors, but there are rumors that SVG is finalizing a deal with Trackhouse Racing to be with them full time in 2024. What does this look like, though? It's not really what we would have thought. But at the same time, we don't really know what this deal actually does look like. It's going to be a wide range developmental program is what was stated by Adam Stern in the article written by The Athletic. Uh, So I'm assuming it could be just a mix of maybe truck races, Xfinity races, cup races, but SVG is going to be in NASCAR in some capacity in the next year. It's just a matter of what he did make his truck series debut this past weekend at IRP. He didn't have the best race. It was actually his oval debut, which was very interesting. He got to a high of 15th and then he ended up finishing in the 19th position, just a lap down. So not the race that he wanted, but he had a good time. So I guess that's all that matters. And especially since he's learning the oval courses and how those work and just truck and the cup cars are so different. So that's another learning curve there, but I I would like to see, and they mentioned this on the broadcast too, I would like to see SVG have to work his way through the ranks like other drivers have had to, because I think it's going to make him a better driver in NASCAR one and two, it's just kind of the way it works. You work your way through the ranks three. I think it's going to make him a smarter driver when it comes to the cup series and racing against these veterans. So um, that's the news that we have there for SVG, or I guess not the news, but the rumors. Uh, let me know in the comments below what you think is going to happen, what you foresee happening with SVG in 2024. Taking a look at your contenders who finished outside the top 10, finishing in the 11th position, Chris Buescher. I'm a little gutted for this one because this means his consecutive top 10 streak at the road courses has ended. This is a good finishing position, though, all things considered. He started in 17th, worked his way up to 11th. A lot of drivers weren't able to really work their way through the field. So I think that's a, I guess, a win for Chris Buescher, though I think he could have contended for the win if just the car maybe was a little bit better. Even too, Brad Keselowski had a bit of an off week and his team was trying to go on an alternative strategy. Same with Denny Hamlin's team. They were on the same strategy call. I think they were trying to bank on a caution coming out at a weird time where they could kind of get back in the mix or take advantage of that to get track position. But again, like I said earlier, there was only one caution for an incident early in the race and that was it. So just kind of a tough day for RFK, but you can't really be mad. You had a great past two weeks at Richmond and at Michigan. So not bad overall. I mean, you're going to have an off week sometimes, and this was it, I think, for that organization, but not terrible. Next up, I want to talk about William Byron because I went into this weekend convinced that he was going to do really well. Unfortunately, though, he failed inspection multiple times this weekend, sent him to the back of the pack, having to do a pass-through penalty on the start of the race. Not a lot of drivers would have been able to work themselves back through the field for a 14th place finish like Byron did, but I mean, it's his strength at road courses one and two is just how he's able to come back from adversity. I feel like him and a majority of the Hendrick Motorsports cars are able to do that really well and Byron fits that category for sure. So not the weekend I thought they could have had. I thought all the Hendrick Motorsports cars could have had a weekend where they all finished inside the top 10 for the first time in a while. I uh, just wasn't so just because of that pre-race penalty for William Byron. In the 22nd position was Brody Kostecki, another supercars driver. I would have loved to have seen him and SVG battle a little bit more this weekend. Unfortunately, though, that was just not the case. He had a solid qualifying run that got him in the 11th position or would have gotten him in the 11th position to start the race. Unfortunately, though, he ended up wrecking out in qualifying, which sent him to a backup car and to the back of the pack. In the 24th position is Mike Rockenfeller, 28th Jensen Button, and for me, the most surprising finishing position of the international drivers, and probably two for the above the yellow line crew, would have been Kamui Kobayashi in the 33rd position. I thought he would have run better. Unfortunately, though, he just ended up spinning out a few times, some on his own, some from help from drivers like Ricky Stenhouse Jr., who seemed to get into the international drivers quite a bit during this race. So overall, they all struggled a little bit, but on a positive note, though, they all said that they 
they had a lot of fun and they would love to come back. Some of these deals that these drivers put together were maybe two years in the making. Long story very short, uh, I love seeing these international drivers racing in these NASCAR cars. For me, it's really fun just to see how well they do, but also too, in, in terms of how this can affect the drivers that are racing in the series week in, week out. How much does it affect the point standings? How much is it going to affect their finishing positions? How much does it affect the stage points as well? So for me, it's very interesting to see. I also love that it's bringing other fans from international territories over to watching NASCAR. So it also exposes us in the United States that maybe just watch only NASCAR to other disciplines of motorsports. And we're like, hey, Shane is in Australian supercars. That's great. Now I want to watch that. So for me, overall, I think it's a win-win and I'm excited to see these drivers back in cup cars, hopefully really soon. With McDowell's win, obviously, this is going to shake up the playoff standings quite a bit. He was already in plus three on points, but it's going to make the points below that cutoff line a little bit more drastic. Ty Gibbs was minus three to the good. Now he's minus 49. Daniel Suarez is now minus 28. Now Elliott and Bowman are minus 80 to the good. I'm so sick of the points discussions they have to win to get in. Now, for Chase Elliott, luckily, Watkins Glen is coming up on the schedule, and this track is in his wheelhouse. However, other drivers are starting to figure out these road courses just as well, and I'm thinking of drivers like Suarez who could win to get in. I'm thinking of maybe Austin Sindrick. Maybe he picks up the pace and he wins and gets in. Michael McDowell could go back to back. Even AJ Allmendinger could get a win, and I granted, Colleg has struggled the past few road course races that they've had this season, but for me, with the road course ringers, it is anyone's game at Watkins Glen because people have started to figure out how these road courses work with the Gen 7 cars. So Chase Elliott is not going to have a walkaway win. It's not going to be easy. He's going to have to fight for it. But this is his best chance this weekend. But if he doesn't win this weekend, I say he is not getting into the championship fight this season. Also, if you're keeping track of the regular season championship, Martin Truex Jr. leads his teammate Denny Hamlin by 60 points. Before we round out the points here, I do want to talk about a prediction I had at the beginning of the season. I said that in 2023, we would only have 13 different winners. Well, with Michael McDowell winning this past weekend, we now have 13 different winners and there is still quite a few races to go this season. So for now, my prediction is correct. If we get a new winner this season, then I'm going to be wrong. But we will have to see. And I, I say I'm probably going to be wrong because, again, Chase Elliott could win this weekend. Daniel Suarez pro hasn't won yet. Uh, Brad Keselowski, shockingly, has not won yet. Uh, Kevin Harvick, I would hope he wins in his final season. He has not won yet either. So part of me is hoping my prediction's wrong, even though I love to be right. I'm hoping my prediction is wrong. But we will have to see moving forward. So that's just a check-in on my preseason predictions and I guess how one of them is going so far. But let's get into our race rating. On social media, I feel like a lot of us have been complaining about the lack of stage breaks at road courses, even though that's what we all wanted going into the season. Everyone's now like, oh, it makes the road course racing so boring. Why did we do this? For some races, it benefits. For some races, I think it hurts. I'm thinking of Sonoma when Martin Truex Jr. dominated, but we were all like, this race is so boring. That's fair. However, what this allows these drivers to do is to put on a clinic, show their strength, or just play off a strategy, and that's what this race had in its power. Like I said, there was only one caution, so it didn't allow the field to bunch back up. It was really a war of who could be mistake-free, who had the best pit strategy, who was the fastest on track, who could work their way through the field to get to the front. And what helped this race the most is that three drivers that were under the cutoff line desperate for a win were the ones competing for the win the entirety of the race, which made this race so tense. I was on the edge of my seat the entire time in the last few laps. I thought Chase Elliott was going to gain on Michael McDowell, and that made me so nervous. And I was like, oh, Chase Elliott, he needs to win to get into the playoffs. But for McDowell, this would be a huge win. And it was so entertaining and so exciting to watch. And just seeing the strategy play out, that was also exciting too. That plus the international driver storylines, this makes this one of the more entertaining road course races of the season. And I also know this leads to the, the discussion, do we keep the Indy road course on the schedule or do we go back to the oval, which is kind of what's being planned, I take it, just with the Indy oval test that's coming up and everything like that. For me, I think the Indy road course has pun intended, I guess, run its course. It was a fun idea, but I think this is the first race out of the, the three that we've now had that actually was decent. Um, but I don't think that means that we need to keep the road course. I think it's good that we try the oval again, just because of what we're seeing with this Gen 7 car and how it performs on tracks like the Indy Oval, I think it's worth a shot. So I'm one of those people that says this was great. This was a great way to end the Indy road course with a, with a solid race, I guess. 
But it's time to move on, in my opinion. That said, though, again, one of the more entertaining road course races this season. I have to give this race a 76% because of that. Might be a little too high, might be a little too low, I'm not sure, but definitely above the yellow line. Now it's getting intense. We only have two races before the playoffs begin. This weekend, we are headed to the Glen with a radio-style broadcast on the USA Network. Make sure to tune in to watch that. And make sure to leave your comments and thoughts below on what we talked about in this video and to interact with me more on social media. Make sure to follow my usernames at underscore Taylor Kitchen underscore on Twitter and TikTok and at Above the Online on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Threads. And of course, visit tobychristie.com for great motorsports content. Make sure to join our live stream on Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to have more opportunities to talk with me and the ATYL crew live. So we'll see you there. Thank you so much for the support. And until next time, we'll see ya. Bye. Want to watch more great NASCAR content? Make sure to click the videos on the screen and look at the links in the description.